Um, so in terms of gender equality and democracies globally, do you see any uh, differences in regions uh, in terms of gender issues in democratic governance that you focus on? So how do approaches differ and what is different in terms of what action is required in terms of some regions or states that you look at yourself? Well, I mean, one of the things that we have to say, interestingly, is that, of course, some of the most established democracies are the worst where gender is concerned. Right. If we talk about gender in terms of the proportion of women in parliament. So, of course, there's many different ways we can measure gender equality. We could look at, you know, the pay gap to women and less than men, how much. Uh, we could look at access to education and so on. We could look at life expectancy. We could look at legislation around things like gender-based violence. But if we stick for a minute with, you know, representation in parliament, you know, Western countries are pretty terrible. Right. And one reason for that, partly, is that they often have, you know, for example, in the UK, we have a Westminster-style system. Um, women have to compete or candidates have to compete at the constituency level. And that often makes it quite hard for even a party that wants to uh, impose more women candidates or ensure more women candidates to successfully do so. Because the idea is that the local constituency will select their own candidate, uh, maybe in a party primary, that person will then be the candidate of the constituency and that shouldn't be interfered with from above. And that can make it quite difficult to encourage people to have a certain type of candidate if you want to affect change. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen in the UK, you know, Tony Blair tried to do this. Uh, with the Labour Party and to promote women. Um, but actually, both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have really struggled to maintain you know, parity or to get close to parity. Um, and the UK Parliament, as in the US, is male-dominated. And so, you know, this is something in which established democracies really haven't been able to make much progress. I mean, some would say you know, that maybe that's too kind, that they've failed to and have not prioritised this. It's perhaps more accurate. Whereas if we go to places like Rwanda, Cuba, uh, Burundi, um, none of them full democracies, uh, we actually see quite high levels of women in parliament. And in fact, Rwanda is the country in the world with the highest proportion of women right now. Right. And that's partly because these countries have adopted quotas. Uh, so often as a result of constitutional review processes, in some cases after you know major conflicts or political crises, but not always, uh, we see new rules that include either the parties themselves adopting a quota, so they basically go man, woman, man, woman in terms of their seats, mm -hmm. or a quota being used of a minimum threshold, often of a third, 33% uh, uh, women in parliament. And that's resulted in significant increases in women in parliament in a number of countries around the world. Now, there's a really interesting question here, which is if we see established democracies not doing this, mm -hmm and authoritarian regimes doing this, why? Okay. The why in the established democracies is probably a combination of men holding those positions and not wanting to give them up for women, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's quite difficult to change institutions, for example, to bring in a quota or a new electoral system once you've got a political system that's been there for 50 or 100 years. It's quite challenging to do that. You know, We saw in the UK the debate over introducing the alternative vote and what happened there. So that's, that's one set of reasons. When we look at the authoritarian states, then we have to ask a different set of questions. Why does President Paul Kagame, who in so many ways is the sort of embodiment of an authoritarian leader, mm -hmm. why does he want to make sure that he has such a high proportion of women in parliament? And there's been some criticism that this is a kind of window dressing effect. If we pack parliament full of women, we'll be seen to be a respectable state that has the same kind of credentials as a democratic state, even though we're actually authoritarian. Interestingly, the research that's been done, and quite a lot of research has been done now in this, suggests that even in places like Rwanda, having more women in parliament can actually make a difference. Um, so in Rwanda and some other countries in Africa, we actually see there seems to be you know, a difference in policy making, partly due to women being there. Uh, not always on big issues, not always on things like GBV, um, but in certain issues, we do see, see movement. And we know, for example, that Countries that have introduced quotas globally tend to do things like spend more money on healthcare. And it appears that one of the reasons that they spend more money on healthcare is that female parliamentarians prioritize healthcare over certain other issues, whereas male politicians often prioritize certain other issues over healthcare. 
So it does seem that even though we might be worried about authoritarian governments using women in parliament as a kind of act of political theater, Mm -hmm. getting women into power actually does make a concrete difference. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some ways, if you believe in health expenditure, does actually make the world a better place. But then that really does ask that question about what needs to happen in those Western countries that we've been talking about to equalize the situation there, because the situation in some of them is really quite diabolical. Um, And I think there is a really big and important question about why that's been allowed to go on for quite so long. Mm -hmm. Do you think quotas would work in a Western context or is there too many questions in terms of often the rhetoric is, you know, we can't just put women in and uh, for lack of qualification or some arguments are we can't use quotas because, you know, we can't uh, elect people just on the basis of their gender rather than their, um, you know, political ability. For example, do you think quotas would work in a Western democracy? I think we can all agree that quotas aren't ideal. We'd like to get to this solution in a more, uh, shall we say, organic way. Um, And quotas can have the stigma that the individuals who are selected through the quota might not be somehow as good or might not have a stronger base, and therefore that can have an implication for their ability to speak out in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So we can agree with that. But I think we should also say that, you know, actually the idea that there aren't sufficient numbers of qualified women to be in Parliament is ridiculous, right. especially when you see the quality of some of the MPs, the male MPs, for example, in the House of Commons in the UK. <laughs> Second, it's fairly clear that, you know, given that those women are high quality, we would not lose quality by promoting those women to Parliament. We'd simply have a fairer, more representative Parliament. That would probably have a positive role model effect in terms of young people seeing that there are as many women in political positions and powerful positions as there are men. Mm -hmm. And probably over time, from what our research shows, may well have an impact, a positive impact on things like healthcare and education spending. So I think there's many good reasons to do it. Mm -hmm. I also think we have to start seeing things a slightly different way around. You know, it's easy to say, well, we shouldn't do this. It's unfair discrimination towards women. What we really should say is we've been unfairly discriminating towards men for about 200, 300 years, and that this would simply be a way of ending that discrimination in favour of men. We're not actually discriminating in favour of women. No one's talking about having a parliament of 90% women or 70% women, which is what happens in some European countries right now. We're simply talking about rolling back the prejudice um, and the advantages that have enabled men to hold these positions for so long. Mm -hmm. And I think when you see it like that, not promoting in favour of women, but simply reducing the discrimination in favour of men. Mm -hmm. And you recognise the number of qualified women who would be able to take up those positions. Then I think introducing a quota seems like a reasonable thing. Now, that's the kind of, as it were, the more theoretical argument. And then there's a practical question of how do you do it? And that is a really big challenge. It's easier to introduce a quota when you have a system of proportional representation where you basically say, you know, party A wants 60% of the votes and so they get this many seats in parliament and the way that you identify those people is party A has a list and you go, right, they've got 50 seats, we take the first 50 people on party A's list. Right. And party A could have had its list, man, woman, man, woman, so you know that when you translate that into parliament, you're going to have 50% men and 50% women. Right. That's relatively straightforward. As mm-hmm. I said, it's much harder when you have a Westminster system where people are being elected individually in constituencies. Right. Because, for example, even if a party agreed to run female candidates in so many constituencies, if in all of those constituencies all of the other parties ran men, There'd be no way of guaranteeing that those women candidates would win, and you may actually end up with most of those women candidates losing. So you'd actually need coordination. You need all of the parties to coordinate and say, we'll all run female candidates in these areas to guarantee that female candidates will come to power. The challenge then, of course, is what we talked about earlier, that the party hierarchy may want to do that, but the local grassroots who think it's their right to choose their candidate might not. So I think there are significant challenges uh, to be able to do this in countries um, that have the sort of first past the post electoral system. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't make it impossible. And greater efforts towards coordinating and promoting women's candidates are definitely required. Yeah. Picking up from what you said regarding uh, states with higher uh, women representatives and uh, health expenditure, there's been a number of articles written in terms of the successes of female-led democracies in dealing with the pandemic. Do you think that is potentially a reason as to why female-led democracies have been so successful? Or is there something else? Is it gender-related or is it just 
uh, happens to be female-led democracies that aren't running on a populist rhetoric? Like, do you, what do you think plays into that? I don't think we have enough evidence right now. It's very clear that a number of female leaders have done particularly well during the crisis. Right. Um, but of course, it's a relatively small sample. Of course. Um, and we don't know whether that's you know because they're women or because they just happen to be good leaders. Yeah. Um, what I do think is really interesting and what perhaps does hint at a gender effect mm -hmm. is that every single one of the irresponsible populists we discussed earlier were men. Right. Every single one of those leaders who denied the existence of corona, who came up with their own miracle cures, who were too arrogant to listen to the scientists, every single one of them was men. Yeah. Of a man. Now that doesn't mean that women can't be populist. It doesn't mean that women can't be, you know, irrationally responsible leaders. Right. Is the empirical reality right now that the countries that did really badly, i.e., those that had authoritarian populist leaders or uh, democratic populist leaders of authoritarian inclinations, um, were all led by men? Mm -hmm. And there is perhaps something, you know, worth us asking there about whether or not the kind of male psyche in somebody like Trump or Bolsonaro, who are very macho leaders, mm -hmm. who talk disparagingly about women um, and about experts and about intellectuals, whether there's something about that mindset that's particularly prone to this kind of irresponsible uh, response to health crises, and whether women are leaders because of the different way in which they're socialized into politics, um, might be more insulated from that risk and therefore more likely to perform well um, during a pandemic. It would be interesting to see, you know, from your, your linking that to the previous question, which is which is very smart, you know, it would be interesting to see whether or not over time mm -hmm. parliaments that have more women in invest more in healthcare and that therefore better place to respond to pandemics because their health systems are more robust. Right. You know, that would seem to be a fairly straightforward, logical link. Mm -hmm. um, but I suspect that we haven't seen women in parliament for that long in some of those countries to really be able to see the cumulative effect of that. Right. But it could well be but that's something that we do start to see in the future and that more research could be done on. Yeah. I think the one, the one final thing that we might want to say on this just to link back to what we were talking about in terms of getting more women into power, power politics and parliament is of course we also need women to want to do that. And one of the other things that keeps women out isn't just quotas, it's also the level of misogyny and hatred that they face online, right. and not just online in, in reality, but in particular online. As we know, you know, Diane Abbott, mm -hmm. a black female MP in the UK, Absolutely. receives, I think, something like the same amount of hate and abuse as all the other MPs put together. Right. Um, most female MPs around the world report that they receive significant more abuse online than their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. In many countries, this will include acts of sort of violence, some small, some big on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. use of intimidatory language, the description of female politicians as prostitutes, etc, etc. Yeah. And so I think we also have to take really seriously the atmosphere around politics and the way in which the violence of politics and the way in which the male violence of politics, particularly online, uh, dissuades women or forces women out of politics. And I think at the last election in the UK, there were a number of female leaders who had served for a long period of time and who decided not to stand again. And one of the reasons was because they'd been in Parliament a long time, but one of the reasons was that it had changed. The Parliament was more aggressive, but also the messages they were getting online were more aggressive and that they didn't want to have to go through that for another term. And I think that's scandalous. You know, it's not just about getting women in power, power in the first place. It's about keeping them there. And I think that's also, you know, really interesting to me. You know, why do we not see more efforts to protect female leaders from this kind of abuse? Again, that suggests that we have a fairly male-dominated system that isn't really looking at the interests of female parliamentarians. Right. So I think we also need to address that side of it if we really want to make a difference to this in the long term. Mm -hmm.